Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the CKC uh, channel. I'm your host, Calvin Klaassen, Fide Master Calvin Klaassen, and uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've been on, probably since last week. So, so yeah, welcome to re the Reflection Show. We, I think we're on episode number three, and uh, things are getting uh, quite interesting. Um, as mentioned uh, in, in my advert on Facebook, we've got another SA champion. Um, with us this evening and actually is the current SA Close champion. So um, feel free to ask as many questions as you can. Um, try to get in the questions as early as possible, guys. We've got um, an interesting show next week as well, talking about the, the, the amount of questions. But um, yeah, try to get them in as early as you can. And uh, at about uh, 20 past or so, I will jump in and start asking questions. We will have some game analysis afterwards as well. So yeah, I think we will go over to the studio now and then Dr. Boa can introduce our special guest. Uh, over to you, Lyndon. Thank you very much, Calvin, and uh, good evening to the viewers. Um, tonight, we've got a very special guest. Uh, he's a young man. Um, at the age of 19, he won the South African Close Championship, and uh, we're honored to have uh, FIDE Master South African Champion uh, Daniel Barish on the show. Daniel, welcome to, uh, to the Reflection Show tonight. Hi, Lyndon. Hi, Calvin. Nice to be back again. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Daniel. Now, I've been privileged to probably be... Uh, to see Daniel play most of his life here in Cape Town. Um, but Daniel, uh, how did it all start? Um, can you tell us who taught you? Because I saw in one of your previous interviews, you said that you started to, to learn chess at the age of four. Um, so I'm something like that, yeah. Uh, sort of first, my, my, my first um, sort of contact with the game of chess was when I was, I think, three. But that I wasn't playing chess at the time. I just found a chess board at my grandparents' flat and happened to sort of ask my granddad to play and sort of played chess, but it wasn't really chess. I began to know how to pieces like move and stuff when I was four or five or so, and I began tournaments when I was six. And, and Daniel, your first sort of uh, uh, tournament year in, in Cape Town, can you recall when when was that? Yeah, um, I, I think it was under, under 10 trials. There wasn't an under eight section at the time. Um, I, I think I was sixth grade one, and I was playing at Hurtiskia um under 10 trials i can't remember exactly what the details but there's under 10 trials now now daniel one of the things that uh if people google you then they will obviously come across uh cape town schoolboy draws gary kasparov uh, and that happened around about 2012 march 2012 uh what can you you tell us about that uh, famous game and how did you feel when you when you drew against uh the great kasparov i mean it, it definitely felt pretty amazing it was um as you said, like quite a big news story at the time, probably a little bit blown out of proportion in reality, but it was, uh, I felt pretty great afterwards. The whole game was very like nerve wracking and uh, exciting. Obviously just, just playing Kasparov was, and well, meeting him really was, was enough of an honor as it was, but um, obviously drawing was pretty, pretty great. Um, I remember it was like pretty intense as well because Kasparov obviously is quite an in intense uh, person, um, very uh, energetic and, um, yeah, I was obviously incredibly nervous. I was quite young. And um, I remember having, basically the rules were quite strict at the time. Like we, as far as I know, we weren't really allowed to sort of uh, go to the bottom between moves, between mm -hmm. because obviously it's a symbol. Um, but uh, obviously because of nerves, like I wanted to go like, and I usually go like a few times during a game. So I happened to sort of jump off and, and run, basically like sprint off the bottom, sprinted back um, while Kasparov was sort of doing the rounds in the symbol. And, and Kasparov, uh, obviously being quite competitive and very intense. Uh, also sort of running around the, <laughs> running around the symbol, trying to put as much time pressure on each of the players as, as the amount of players reduced near the end of the symbol. So yeah, it was definitely quite an experience. No, well, you certainly you certainly put your name on the map uh, as as well. And uh, I mean, I, I recall I was part of that symbol. And uh, I mean, basically, you were the only half a point there that uh, we, we got in that, that symbol there. But I mean, as you said, fantastic experience just to meet Gary Kasparov mm -hmm. and, and have an opportunity to engage. Did you guys analyze afterwards? Um, no, not, not at all. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> it would have been great. But, um, yeah. 
Well, I, I'm sure after that, Daniel. After that, I I sort of picked you picked you up when you you were playing quite a lot of league chess uh, at at that time. And I mean, you were well, a ten year, twelve year old kid, and and you were playing in the Premier Division of 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 the league and holding your own uh, on let's call it the the medal boards. How did you feel about that? Um. Well, league was pretty fun. It was just nice being part of the club and playing um playing the league. I mean. Um, yeah, it was just, I think, great practice games. They sort of uh, getting some experience against seasoned, seasoned Cape Town players. And, and Daniel, you uh, obviously we recognize that you are a, a, a young and a special talent. How do you how do you train? How do you keep chess fit in this uh, time where there's no over the board chess? Uh, because of course. Um, as the South African champion, you would have been playing quite a lot of tournaments. And in fact, you did. You won the Western Province Open in uh, in 2020. Uh, but that was sort of the last tournament. So what are you doing nowadays to keep chess fit? Well, it's, it's pretty difficult, to be honest, um, because it's not, it's not really the, the lack of means, really. It's more lack of motivation due to the lack of tournaments. Um, often when you want to train, you need to have some sort of goal in mind, a specific tournament. Um, but now with the lack of tournaments, the lack of real like clarity as to when there will be tournaments, it's quite difficult to motivate oneself. But over the last couple of months, since December, since Christmas, I've been working quite a bit. Hopefully tournaments start up again soon. But as you said, like the last time I played over the board was, was in March last year in the Western Province Open. Now, if, if someone was to ask Daniel Barish, what is the style of Daniel Barish? Would it be attacking? Would it be positional? What would you say? Um, I, I also ask myself that. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm probably leaning towards more um, like technical or positional than attacking. Um, I think probably one of the biggest influences on my play when I, when I was young, I read a book on Karpov. And that's, I guess, sort of who my, uh, uh, the player who my uh, style sort of follows. But I mean, when the opportunity arises, like I saw the essay closed, uh, then you 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 take that tactical finish when it when it comes. Yeah, I mean, I I, I do <laughs> I do what I think is best. I don't I don't try like dictate uh, my play based on what my style I what I perceive my style to be. I just sort of I guess I, I play what I, what I think is best. That's, um, yeah, I I mean I, I try to play as principled as possible. So if I see that an attack should be the way to go here, I'll go for the attack with a uh, whether I consider myself an attacking player or not. Daniel, thanks for that. Um, Daniel, I was looking at a few of your games uh, uh, yesterday when I was preparing for, for our interview, and I noticed that you have been playing quite a number of tournaments in Europe, and uh, you played some some great names. Uh, I mean, I saw Belyowski's name in, in, in one, and did I see Ivanchuk's name in, in, was it the online tournament? Or was it uh, that was the online Olympiad, yeah. I didn't unfortunately get to play Ivan Trick in person. That would have been pretty amazing too. But now, uh, first, tell us about Belyowski. Uh, how did it feel to play a, a living legend? Um, well, I mean, just like Kasparov, um, it was pretty awesome just to play him. Um, and being able to draw that game was obviously better. Um, I was, I was, it was sort of bittersweet though because that game was actually one of my better games that tournament. It was a very, very bad tournament, but that was sort of like the shining light of that tournament. And uh, I was actually sort of, I think, if not winning, I was very close to winning that game. In fact, yeah. I didn't was a little bit bittersweet there. Yeah, I know. I mean, he, but I mean, he's one of the most experienced grandmasters, and and uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's the probably one of the only grandmasters to have played for four different countries at the Olympiad as mm. well. So uh, it's like, pretty incredible. I mean, just his longevity is, is virtually unmatched. Um, yeah. I was also reading up about him before and after the game as well, and I think he also holds some record for um, one of I think tied maybe. Um, when it comes to the most world champions beaten ah. uh, by a non-world champion, I assume. Yes, well, it's a, that's a very interesting statistic because I was also reading up on it uh, recently, uh, Daniel, because I know Geller had quite a nice uh, uh, plus score against some of the world champions. And then the other guy that um, I was reading about recently was uh, Stein, uh, who yeah. also had the plus score against many of the Soviet champions as well. Wh yeah. Which... Who's your uh, sort of favorite player besides Karpov that you that you studied a few years ago that you would follow if you had an opportunity to study his or her games? Um, I think it probably goes. Uh, I mean, Carlson's obviously the one you probably follow the most nowadays, seeing as he is 
pretty much a, or has been at least dominant for the last 10, 12 years. Um, if you're talking about older players, it's probably Capablanca was my was my favorite, just because of the simplicity and clarity of the games and his wins. Yeah, no, now, so so that you didn't be consistent with your Karpov Capablanca, your positional type type style, Daniel. Um, Daniel, in in December 2019, you you won the essay closed at a relatively young age of 19. Uh, how did you do it? What what was your your secret in in that event? Um, I think basically it was taken game by game. I, I can't say there was some sort of grand plan to in, to it. I I definitely went into the tournament. Um, I mean, I was going into it planning to win it, obviously. Um, and it was going it was pretty smooth sailing up until um, well, the first uh, shock was um, losing to I think I was on three and a half out of four if I recall correctly, and I lost to Michael James, which is a bit of a bummer. And then I think I sort of recovered. Um, I was still leading up until I think it was around eight. Or oh, no, so the second last round, so it'd be around 10. And I lost to to Kenny, who was just behind me. Yeah. And after I think it was a dead heat, we were both tied in the final of, uh, I think it was six and a half each. And then um, I just happened to be, be fortunate enough to win the last game. And he, I think, drew the last game. And I was well, well, well. Yeah, but I mean, you uh, a great tournament that you played. I mean, as you said, uh, the thing about the essay close, it, it's like a marathon. You've got to, even if you, because the, the interesting thing is, of course, um, Michael James uh, beat the number one, two, and three uh, yeah. finishes at the at the essay close. So, yeah. uh, well well done to him. Uh, what did you think? Was it your first game against uh, Grandmaster Kenny Solomon? Um. Over the board, um, over the board classical games, yeah, we played before in, in Blitz and online, but that was the first over the board classical game, I think. Because I, I recall that was a very interesting uh, game with Kenny playing King F8 and Rook H5. Yeah, it was definitely something I hadn't seen before. That uh, opening idea. Yeah, I know that. But uh, but Daniel, I mean, I I was looking at a few of your games at that is a closer. I looked at all the games, and uh, I mean, I recall Ben Hercules, the knight f6 little move that that you had there, and and there was a quite a, a, a nice uh, rook c5, I think, against Poseidon note. So I mean, there was a couple of good couple of good uh, positional games uh, that that you essayed in in that uh, South African close. Yeah, um, I think a lot of the games were sort of touch and go. Um... Watch his game in the first round. I think I, I was winning, then I was losing, and then we drew. Could have gone either way. Um, the game against Ben Hercules, I was also I was much worse at one point as well, and I was lucky to sort of pull that one out of the bag. Um, Keith, I, I was better as well. Then I, then I was, I think, virtually losing and managed to sort of save that. So, I mean, it really could have gone either way. Against uh, Matt Pond, final round, I was very, very lucky to win that one. So, um, I think it was uh, basically everything sort of went my way that tournament. Um, yeah. Well, well, I mean, but that's games, um, sort of. Cabo Blanco would say good players make their own luck. So maybe that's what you did. You you made your own luck. Mm. Well, maybe I was just was lucky. I think probably was just. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you played very strongly there, Daniel. Um, Daniel, after that, you you went uh, overseas and you played a, a few tournaments. Uh, which which would you uh, think is your significant tournaments? Would you say the Czech Republic tournaments or or Gibraltar that you played? Which one was your favorite? Um, well, the one I played most over the years is this tournament in Pride of Bitsa in the Czech Republic. I played it, I think, like basically 10 or 11 times uh, since I was sure. basically, like the whole, my, whole, my whole school career. I played it every single year in July. Um, but um, I wouldn't say that was my favorite. There are some other tournaments I've played. Um, most of them, <laughs> most of my favorite tournaments involve being on the beach somewhere. So the, 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 tournaments in, the tournament I played in Greece in 2019 was definitely, I think, up there. But um, probably the Actually, that probably was my favorite. But the second favorite would also be on the beach in, in Corsica. Um, both times I happened to play uh, like really, really well. So I don't know, maybe the, the beach has something to do with it. I don't know. Well, now that the beaches are open, Daniel, I think the chess players have to look out for you again. <laughs> yeah. And also, conversely, I mean, uh, the two times I played in like freezing cold winter conditions in, in Europe was, was London Classic and Gibraltar last year. And both those are probably two of my worst tournaments in Ever. So I think I think they definitely might have something to do with the weather and, and the beaches. And yeah. Yeah. No, no, I think, uh, uh, and of course, as you said, you at some stage one has to acclimatize to these things because um, you you also got your first uh, I am norm, was it in, in Greece that you got your first I am norm? Yeah. 
that was also like a big factor to me liking the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Daniel, so we we well on our way now. You you're hoping to to score two more IM norms or or even just uh, directly at the Continental Championship. What are what are your next aims and objectives when over the board tournament returns? I mean, you pretty much said it. Like, I still need two more norms and to get my rating to 2400 to get the IM title, and that's that's the goal, pretty much. Um, I, was, I was very close in the tournament I played directly after the Greek tournament. I was playing in Romania. And I think I missed out on the, on the second norm by something like two performance rating points, which was, which was very upsetting considering I lost the last round. Um, so, yeah, that was a, another missed opportunity there. So, it, by two Buchol points? Yeah, by, by two performance rating Yeah, Buchol's performance rating points, yeah. Well, I can tell you that there was a guest on the show two weeks ago who missed a GM title by a half of Buchholz. Yeah, no, you, you told me that story as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so no, yeah. we, we know about them as, as well, Daniel. And yeah. Daniel, now, it, when you study your chess, I mean, is it mostly computer? Do you use books? Uh, or what would you say is the, the modern champion, which you are, uh, what does the modern champion use to prepare? Um, it's, it's almost exclusively computers, but I have actually, um, like, as I've got older, I'm sort of also getting into books more again. I've actually got, like, Boretsky, who just happened to be, like, next to me. I'm in my sort of guest room here. It just happens ah. to be right here, which I, I have been looking at for a while now. Sort of slowly grinding through it, grinding through it, about halfway now. So uh, hopefully I finish it again. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and So most computers, but also some books mixed in. No, no, thanks for that, Daniel, because I also noticed that you have an interest in artificial intelligence or computer science. Is it, is it something that, uh, that comes naturally to you working with computers? Um, well, that's what I'm studying, yeah. I'm studying, hopefully, to get into that field. It's definitely something which I find interesting. I wouldn't say like I, I know too much about like the specifics of it, the, the deep dive into it, but I definitely find it interesting and the potential seems to be there. That's what I'm looking to go into more deeply um, in the next year or two. And uh, what uh, um, what year will you be completing uh, this year at the University of Stellenbosch? Uh, third year. Third year. So third I'll year, be no this year and most likely will be going hopefully into honours next year. Well, we can only wish you well because there seems to be a lot of online uh, studies happening and, and everything else. But uh, I suppose yeah. that's all for the course no nowadays. Daniel, would you would you say that you've uh, studied some classical chess uh, in in the past, or is it something that you that you're still busy doing as you as you continue on your journey? I, I definitely have done it. Um, um, I I read back when I was younger. I read uh, Zurich 1953, um, and I also have uh, read large chunks of um, Kasparov's Margaret Peterson's, but I haven't completed that properly. But I yeah, read parts. Um, and a lot of that I just sort of picked up, uh, like classics, I mean, just sort of reading, I, I wouldn't say like a system, like systematic like study of it, but you do pick it up when you go through games. And, and if, uh, if you were to give advice to, to younger up and coming players, uh, Daniel, how can they improve the chess? What would be sort of a, uh, the top two or three things that a, a young player that is, let's say, 1700 wanting to, to, to break through to 1900, what should he or she do? I think it largely depends on, um, as you said, like rating bands, basically. A 1500 is very different to a 1900 or so, and 1700. Um, I think up until maybe 18, 19, 2000, uh, I think the majority of games actually decided like purely by tactics, tactics and calculation. I think that should probably be the focus for the vast majority of people. And then as you sort of improve, uh, you gradually phase in um, theoretical in games like uh, um, like filled opposition, look in opposition, and so on, as well as I think classics is obviously also like a very common recommendation. I um, also uh, liked probably one of, the, one of the biggest sort of benefits I got out of reading a chess book was um, my, my positional play improved when I read uh, Agard's uh, Grandmaster Preparation series. Not, not, not the full series, but the, the one positional playbook. It's not very difficult. I think it's probably aimed towards 1800s or so. Mm. But it is, I thought it was extremely beneficial because it boils uh, positional play down to three concepts. I, I keep raving about this book because I really think it is good. Um, it, bo it boils positional play down to three crucial concepts which are, uh, are like prophylaxis basically weaknesses and um and improving a workplace piece so like piece play sort of 
And using those three questions, um, what are the weaknesses, um, what is my opponent's plan, and what's my worst place piece, you can basically find the plan in the vast majority of positions, 90% easily. I think like working on that is probably um, sort of the next step up after your tactics have been um, improved. Daniel, thank you very much for that. So I think uh, some valuable advice there from the tactics to, as you say, profile access weaknesses and improving uh, the worst place piece. I mean, uh, that sounds like very sound ad advice uh, at this stage. Uh, Daniel, it's now 20 past seven. I'm, uh, let's go over to, to Calvin in the studio and just uh, see if there are any questions in the chat room. Thanks from, from, from my side, Daniel, but I will be back. Uh, Calvin, over to you. Okay, uh, yeah, it's been interesting and uh, welcome to everybody in the show who's just tuned in. Uh, I see Babiki is also saying hi in the chat, welcome. And uh, yeah, just a couple of questions here. Thanks to Sean and Mark for the questions thus far. Uh, guys, leave your questions in the chat if you still want uh, to ask Daniel something. So um, yeah, and by the way, if you, if you don't know how to type in the chat box, if you are new, just uh, sign up and press the follow button and that will enable the chat. Um, for you. Okay, so first question is from Sean. I believe that's Sean Wallenberg. He says, um, Daniel, I always admired how your dad supported you. I have not seen him for a while now that you are now that you are grown up. How is he doing these days? And is your little brother keen on playing? No, my dad's great. He's doing he's doing fine. Um, my brother's playing, but on and off, he doesn't have, really have as much motivation as we'd like, unfortunately. He's got some other interests, uh, like uh, computer games. <laughs> but yeah, he's still playing on and off. Okay, uh, fantastic. And uh, maybe just a side question from, from me, Daniel, is uh, how did that, do um, um, you think that, that support from your dad going to tournaments and so on was quite beneficial? Was it, did you enjoy it? Some, some people don't like it, so some people do. How did you experience this? Oh, uh, it definitely was uh, essential. I mean, uh, I wouldn't even be close to where I am now without the support that I got. Um, whether I enjoyed it, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's always fun when when you're getting support when when uh, you're winning. Uh, when you when you're losing, it's not as much fun, um, but it's still obviously essential. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Daniel. And then um, second question comes from uh, ML eighteen oh eight. That's of course Mark Lewis. Uh, Mark says. Um, in the past, you played very fast, but recently you play much slower in over-the-board events. What caused this transition? Um, I'm not sure when I was playing very fast, but I, as far as I can remember, I, I've been having like time time trouble issues for at least the last couple of years. Maybe when I was, I think maybe like between ten and fifteen, I was playing quite quickly. But um, now I think it's I'm not sure what exactly caused my time trouble. I think. <laughs> I wish I knew. I'm trying to solve it myself. Uh, indecisiveness, I guess, is obviously one of the main factors. Um, maybe lack of confidence in my own play. I don't know what it is exactly, but I'm working on it. And uh, I think a lot of it comes with sort of sharpening up and doing more uh, calculation exercises, which will hopefully help um, improve the time trouble issue. Okay, and and I would maybe just add to that. Maybe it's just uh, father time also adds to that uh, maturing a bit. You start. <laughs> Seeing more dangers than when you super young, you don't see any. Just want to charge forward. Yeah, I definitely uh, seeing seeing many ghosts on the chessboard now. So yeah, does, that's that's definitely factor. Does come along with with age, I would think. Um, okay, and then um, also from Mark, uh, Mark is saying, I still remember our game at the Manyanani event. I think in 2015, you played the Grunfeld. Yeah, uh, and Grunfeld. You played the Grunfeld. I have not seen you play that line again. Can you comment comment on this in terms of your repertoire? Um, yeah, I haven't played the Grunfeld for a while. Um, I, I've, I would say I've phased it out completely, but I'm not playing as much as I used to. Uh, it's mostly, I think stylistically, I prefer uh, more solid openings like the like the Nimza, um, which is what I'm playing nowadays mostly, and some other things. Okay, so maybe you just had to uh, get Mark a bit off balance there with your Grunfeld on the day. <laughs> no, I was, I was playing it almost exclusively. I was playing exclusively, actually, I think, oh, okay. like 2015 and up, maybe up until three years ago. But then okay. I sort of switched uh, to the Nimzo. Okay, interesting stuff. And uh, we've got one or two more questions popping in. Thanks, guys. So uh, let's see. The next one is from Babiki. Babiki says, Daniel, what is next for you chess-wise? 
So we maybe touched on that earlier, but uh, yeah, what what do you have in mind uh, next? Maybe uh, if you have something in mind after Over the Board comes back or even during this online, what do you have next planned for chess? Um, so I'm pretty much trading towards uh, the return of Over the Board tournaments. I don't have as much of an interest in online chess, unfortunately, just because, um, I mean, my main goal involves getting, getting uh, uh, norms and titles. I think that's sort of like where the most competitive chess is played. Um, so I'm basically working towards over the board chess again. I'm, I don't know when exactly it's going to return. I was actually hoping to play in December and then January and then February, but nothing really materialized, unfortunately, because there aren't many tournaments here or in Europe. So I'm sort of just waiting. And most likely I'll, I'll probably be playing again, maybe in June, July, around those holidays. So that's sort of what I'm aiming towards now. Okay. So guys, uh, Daniel is preparing, are you? That's the big question. You guys should get yourself ready for over the board. Uh, okay, and then next one comes from, um, yeah, this is the last question for now. Cognitive uh, Discord says, hi, Daniel. Would you recommend Chessable as a useful website to study chess openings? I mean, I'm obviously a little bit biased here, but uh, <laughs> I think it's pretty good. I, I do use it myself quite a bit. Um, so it's not like I'm just selling, <laughs> not just uh, sort of, a, I'm a, I do sort of practice what I preach here. Um, unfortunately, I also get like lazy with this, so I, I let things sort of slide and, and forget my lines as a result of not really repeating it enough. But um, yeah, I, I would say it's pretty good. Um, I, I wouldn't, again, like I wouldn't say that that should be like a primary sort of training uh, tool. Um, I think that, or at least not the openings uh, side of it. I think that the tactics and in-game side is, is also something which is with a lot more focus and, and most people give it. Um, the opening tool should probably be used or uh, well, the opening side of, of chessable should probably use maybe like 10 to 20 percent for most people uh, of, of your chess time and the rest should be devoted to whether it's on chessable or whether it's anywhere else should be used on in games and tactics i think and calculation and playing and all that other stuff okay so so there you have it guys and by the way i think daniel you've got about two courses at least on there right open one openings one in game yeah. so, so yeah. you guys can go check out daniel as well he's got uh, some stuff available on Chessable as well. So definitely beneficial, I would say. Um, so yeah, and just uh, so, some comments here by Sean as well, and then I'll uh, uh, hand it over to you, Lyndon. So Sean just says here, thanks, Daniel. Yes, I remember my dad also always being there for me at school tournaments. It's priceless. And uh, mm. greetings to your dad, Sean Wellenberg, and all the best for your norms. So yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, thanks. And yeah, that's it for the chat box for now. So uh, yeah, over to you, London. You can continue. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Daniel, You would you say that uh, by you participating in that uh, 2015 essay close that, uh, and the 2017 one, that it certainly helped you for 2019? Um, how, how do you describe that, that run up of your, of your, because I mean, at the age of 19, you've, you've played three essay closed already. Yeah. So um, the 2015, 2017 close definitely were, of course, like very beneficial. I mean, like all tournaments are beneficial, really. Um, just practice, but um, the close obviously in particular because you learn to like you learn, learn about the plays, you learn about the format, and so on. Um, the 2015 and 2017 close are both like very big disappointments. Um, in 2015, I was, I was hoping to qualify basically for the Olympia team, and it didn't obviously happen. Essentially, because I lost the last two rounds against I think it was uh, Donny and against Mo. So that basically ended my hopes for the Olympia team there and then. Um, but obviously, lessons learned. Um, 2017, I can't remember now exactly what even happened there. Um, well, Calvin and Mabusela dominated. Going a blank. <laughs> I can't remember the yeah. 2017. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I, remember, I think I drew the last round. Uh, yeah, Calvin and Mabu won that, um, of course. Um, I'm trying to remember my own sort of results. I, I, sort of blending together to the same venue as the 2019 one. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, sort of uh, blending together. But yeah, both them, uh, 2015 and 2017, weren't, uh, like, I was hoping to qualify for the Olympia team at the time, and it didn't really happen. So I, I wasn't too pleased with my play, uh, both those tournaments. But I suppose that all of those tournaments sort of bring you to a point where uh, you've gained the experience now, and, and now you're able to, to project yourself. And, and I mean, as you said, even... Um, with this last essay close that you won, you had two losses, but you you still fought back. You were resilient enough to to continue with uh, with your march. Uh, would you say that mental toughness is is a, a bearish trademark? Um, I, I mean, I, I'm no one to judge my own mental toughness, but I, I think it's definitely important um, being able to bounce back from defeats. And um, I think as long as you have the desire, 
um, to improve and to win. I think the mental toughness sort of follows on from that. Um, and I, I don't know, yeah, I still, I think I always have the desire to win and uh, to improve. Daniel, you, um, you've you beaten quite a number of grandmasters. Um, how how do you do it? I mean, it, when you play against the, the grandmasters, particularly those in, in Europe, and, and I do recall that uh, one tournament in Johannesburg, I think it was a PSS a Rapid, you, you beat Grandmaster uh, Stream uh, from, from India uh, in one of those early rounds. Do you do extra preparation when you play the GMs or, or do you take extra time to think? What, what is your secret when you play these top uh, Grandmasters? No, I think I basically just treat it as a normal game. There's nothing, um, a, a GM is obviously <laughs> stronger than I am on average, but it's, it's still just a person, just a normal player. And they also make mistakes, um, just like all of us do. So I think the best thing is not to psych yourself out and just play as you normally would. Um, and often you will find that mistakes do come. Um, hope, hopefully from your opponent, not just from you, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> And I mean, it, it, it seems as if you are happy to punish those mistakes. <laughs> when I get them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, if, uh, uh, who has been the, the most famous uh, 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 grandmaster that you've uh, beaten? I mean, uh, can you recall uh, which one has been memorable for you? Um, the most memorable one was definitely the first one. Um, uh, and it was actually the strongest one, funnily enough. And it was, it was actually all the way back in 2016. Um, it was against Glazer of, and that's probably the, um, like, I think most of my games against Grandmasters when I won, um, they weren't really like I outplayed them start to finish. They, they were like, the evaluation would have like seesawed a little bit, or there would have been some like, it might have been equal and then there was a blunder or something like that. But this game I actually played like really, really well from start to finish. And I would say like, I even outplayed him in that one game. Most of the other games, most of the wins, I wouldn't say I outplayed him. Well, I played the GM, but um, in this one, I think I think it probably is is true. That was against um, a Russian GM. I think he's rated twenty five hundred and five. Um, yeah. Evgeny, uh, Evgeny Glazerov was was the was that uh, opponent. Well, I mean that that is a uh, um, and I mean at uh, in twenty sixteen, how old would you have been? About uh, fifteen and a half. Yeah, fifteen and a half or so. Yeah, no, I mean, but th those are phenomenal things. Uh, Daniel, if you, uh, if I, like, in your shoes, um, Sean asked the question, what is next for you? And you are now preparing yourself. Um, would you say that you'd like to, to become a grandmaster in the next three years? Would, would that be a doable definitely, option yeah. if, if over um, the board returns? That's definitely the goal. I mean, that was especially the goal. I mean, the goal was actually two years. That was before the pandemic hit. Um, I was hoping to do it basically um, before the end of next year. That was the goal. But um, I'm not sure exactly how likely that is now with the pandemic, considering I'm not even an IM yet because I can't really play tournaments. Um, but yeah, I would say it's still definitely on, on, on the radar. It's definitely one of the goals still. No, no, I, Daniel, I mean, we can only but wish you well with, uh, with those goals. But as you said, you know, um, you should still take this time to prepare, as you've, you've told, uh, told us, that uh, that's what you're busy working on at, at the moment. And um, Daniel, you're going to show us some games tonight. Um, and uh, I've, uh, I've seen you, you've chosen two, two nice games that, that you'll go through with us as well. Um, when you analyze your own games, do you... Uh, type your own notes on a computer do you how, how do you go about um, for us uh, to, to learn from you as the SA champion um I, I wish i could sort of give advice on this but i'm not really as diligent as i would like to be when it comes to analyzing my games most of the time after the game obviously just out of curiosity i, I check the game um afterwards either with my opponent and post-mortem and then with an engine afterwards and I write, maybe write some quick notes down but um and usually I'll try to revisit, revisit the games after the tournament, but it doesn't always happen just due to sort of, I guess, laziness. Time, yeah. Um, it just sort of, you sort of like forget, you put it off for a week and another week and it never really happens. Um, but obviously it must be done at some point. And um, yeah, so I, I, when I do analyze my games, I, I go into like quite a bit of depth usually. I try to basically figure out exactly what, um, what is going wrong and why I'm losing games. Um, there's a concept which I'm sort of reading about in the last, year or two, I think, which is really beneficial and very applicable to chess. And that's the idea of deliberate practice, which is basically where you're not just sort of 
training aimlessly, but training with like a purpose of improving one specific facet of your game. So um, for instance, um, my time travel is obviously an issue and costs me many, many games as we will actually see in uh, both these games, I think. Um, so one way I'm trying to sort of train that is to um, maybe give myself a calculation exercise and then time myself and sort of basically um, once the time is up, I basically make a move and then compare it to the answer. So that's, I think, an example of like deliberate practice, basically um, identifying obviously weaknesses and then not just sort of training aimlessly, like just doing random tactics and just reading through games and newspaper articles and chess, uh, magaz chess based magazine and so on, but actually sort of training specifically the facets which are uh, costing you points. Daniel, thank you very much for, for that uh, important concept, the deliberate practice. And uh, it's something that I recall uh, reading about with Botvinnik as well. In You know, in Mikhail Botvinnik's days, they still used to smoke at the board. So uh, mm. he used to actually uh, train by having some of the uh, yeah. Russian grandmasters smoke, uh, you know, and then he has to think in that cloud uh, around him. So certainly he was also doing That's some exactly. deliberate as, as well. No, thanks for, for, for that, Daniel. So I think uh, viewers, we're coming to that stage now where uh, Daniel is going to show us uh, one or two of his games. And uh, Daniel, I mean, just to, to recap, um, fantastic uh, starting at the age of three, three and a half and playing your first sort of under 10 tournament when you were still six. And then you continue to, to draw with uh, Kasparov uh, in 2012. And um, I must say, I was very happy when I saw that because I was sitting uh, about two boards away from you when uh, I got crushed in about 22 moves by Kasparov <laughs> on, on that day. And, uh, and there you were holding the flag for us. Uh, as well. And uh, and thereafter, uh, Daniel, it was always good to see you playing in the league because I do think that it's so important for young players to play in things like the Western Province League that is an excellent league because you've got many Olympians, many top uh, club and provincial players, and you, you played for your various clubs uh, in that. And then, of course, you're, you're, you're not shy to go out and play you know, those those big tournaments. So uh, well done to you. And and the other key themes, Calvin, that I picked up from Daniel was um, looking at tactics when you uh, um, have below 1800 or 1700. And then after that, looking at profile access, weaknesses and uh, improving peace play. And then right at the end, Daniel had a bit yeah. of deliberate practice as well. I think I think the book specifically to recommend for those three positional concepts that I think I just should re reiterate is um, our guards, uh, grandma's preparation, uh, positional play. Yeah. Yeah. Jake, Jacob Argard, excellent writer uh, from Denmark, lives in Scotland now, and uh, I mean he's written a, a number of fantastic books and um, and yeah, I think um, Argard is certainly somebody that uh, I would uh, agree there with Daniel as as well. Daniel, we're going to go over, it's now 20 to 8, we're going to go over to, to the games. So uh, from my side, thank you very much, uh, uh, Daniel. I'm going to hand you back to Calvin, and then we're going to start looking at the games. But uh, Calvin, over to you. Okay, let's switch over to the chessboard, guys. So Daniel, also get yourself ready there. All right. Board. And yeah, we're at the chessboard now, so... So yeah, how many games are we going to have a look at, Daniel, and who are we starting with? Um, I think we'll probably look at two. Both of them are fairly similar in the sense that I lost both. Okay. And both of them have been rookie games. Um, and both of them obviously hurt quite a bit. <laughs> so yes. yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. So the first game is against a, a GM called uh, Dimitri Kriakvin. I think he was sort of verging on 2600, maybe just underneath 2600 when I played him. This okay. was at Gibraltar. Um, uh, was it last year? Yeah, last year, um, 20, 2020. And it was one, obviously one of the last tournaments I played, the last video tournament I played. And it was a very, very bad tournament. And this was also uh, one of the reasons <laughs> this loss. Um, and yeah, we'll see it here. So d4, e6, c4, bishop, d4, check. I was already sort of throwing out prep here. I didn't think he was going to play this at all. Okay. Uh, bishop, d2, a5. So I was basically just out of prep on my own here. Um, this is obviously nothing like too unusual yet, but uh, just it really wasn't like a good start. And he's yeah. playing something different. Like a weird uh, bogo. Yeah, so it's a different move again. It's it sort of throwing me out of it because I was, yeah. was wasn't sure if he play f5 at some point or why he was basically delaying knight f6. Yes. Uh, but then he basically transposed uh, with knight c6, knight c3, knight f6, bishop okay. g2. Uh, castles. I mean, it's nothing too um, noteworthy here. I basically want to get to the end game 
um, which I found quite interesting. Okay. But um, so rook e8, rook c1. I probably should have just played a3 immediately. Um, just get the bishop here. I was worried at some point about like a5 and knight a5. Yeah. But I think I think it's probably just better to allow that. It's not as dangerous as it. Grab might the bishop be. immediately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's grab the bishop here, exactly. Now somehow you you in these lines you're always trying to uh, win that tempo by saying I'm not gonna play a3. You have to take, and yeah. the other guy doesn't want to yeah. take, and so interesting battle. What's about the weakness on on b3, which arrives after take c3, b takes c3. Yeah. Um, after, after black plays a4. So rook c1, um, e5, d5, knight b8, bishop g5, knight pd7. And he has obviously, uh, this is, I, I, I'm a, when I was analyzing the game, I saw um, knight e4 afterwards, which seems very strong. I didn't, I, I can't even remember if I considered this during the game. And the point is that after h6, uh, bishop h4, knight um, okay. plays uh, g5, just knight, knight f takes g5. Maybe it's, it's already uh, very good for for white this um maybe something like bishop h3 is also possible in the future i don't know yeah so After. what i actually played the game was was bishop h3 immediately oh, because okay. uh yeah i was worried about uh the bishop ending, ending up being bad once i play e4 and so on yes so i wanted to trade it off as quickly as possible for this bishop on c8 okay. um but it wasn't really best i it was quite slow, and um, at this point, I was already like uh, any sort of advantage I might have had at the opening was gone. So, bishop h3, h6, bishop takes f6, knight takes f6, bishop takes c8, queen takes c8, king g2 to just to cover the, the h3 square, yeah, and queen, uh, queen b7. So, I'm already, like, as I said, a little bit worse here. I'm not, um, yeah, nothing too spectacular out of this opening, unfortunately. So now I play a3, which takes c3, rook takes c3, and a4. So I basically got the worst of both worlds here. I got stuck with the weakness on, on b2 and, and b3, and also no bishop there. Um, still, like, it's not particularly bad. I may be a little bit worse, but it's not what I wanted out of this opening at all. Yeah. So uh, e4, knight e4, rook e5. Also, sort of uh, scaring me a bit with this rook h5 idea. Yes. Um, so h3, uh, c6, b takes c6, b takes c6, and it's, it's pretty clear that white is uh, a little bit worse than the count of, as I said, the, the b2 pawn. Um, so I play a sort of like a tough decision here. Do I play um, b4 and sort of allow a takes b3, as I played in the game actually, and, and leave a weakness on a3? Or do I just ignore this for the time being and leave the weakness of b2 and, and try something else? And um, probably best would actually be to just leave it for the time being and maybe try play e3, knight e2, knight f4, which does a job of covering the h3 pawn, which could become weak after rook h5, and also clearing the d file so I can maybe attack rook the d1. Yeah. Exactly. So that probably would have been better. Um, I didn't play that. Uh, I played b4. Um, okay. So a3, b3, queen takes b3. Rook a, rook a5, rook b1, um, and c5, knight c2, d5, c takes d5, knight takes d5, rook c4, queen e6. This is all pretty okay from, from both sides. There wasn't anything to really uh, mention here. Yeah. Um, a4, king h7, and um, here I make a, quite a sizable mistake. Um, I, I feel like I, I, basically in the game, I was feeling like I was basically worse the whole time. So. I felt like I was fighting for a draw pretty much. And I was trying to sort of uh, rush it to that result. I was trying to sort of force the draw by trading off pieces a little bit too quickly here. So I played knight e3. But better would have been to just play knight a3. Um, I'm actually doing pretty much totally fine. Like there's nothing really to worry about as it turns out. Um, a4 is weak, but so is uh, c5. It kind of yes. balances out here. Yeah. And uh, the, move, the move e3, Daniel, what, what do we reply here? Yeah. Uh, that's a... Pretty good question. Might have been interesting that I was worried about during the game. Maybe, um, maybe I, that's something that kind of spurred you to control the score. Yeah. So maybe um, e3, f3, it doesn't look particularly great, but... Um, but the e3 pawn could yeah. be a problem later on. E rook e4 yeah. or something. Exactly. It might, it might actually be falling after rook e4, knight c2. Yeah. So maybe it's... Yeah. I can't remember exactly what spooked me here, but... 
I think I might have just been trying to force the draw a little bit too quickly. Um, but I play knight e3, and the problem here is, of course, that I end up with double. The board. Yeah. yeah, f takes e3. And now I think that the bigger problem, though, was that I sort of underestimated this sort of sequence, which uh, which which now comes. So rook b8, uh, queen takes b8, queen takes c4, um, king f2, rook takes a4, and I'm obviously down a pawn. Yep. And um, now I, I thought that this rook in game, which comes after queen b5, I thought this should be like a fairly, I thought I'd have good drawing chances here, but it's actually quite tricky and it's not so easy to draw at all. Um, so black plays h5. Um, I think sort of just, yeah. Um, Taking this, space. Yeah, or grabbing some space, yeah. yeah. Um, and here, I also make another inaccuracy. I, I should realize that there's no, re no real rush to take on c4. Um, because, I mean, black can't really do much in this situation. Black will probably have to take on b5 himself. Um, so I could play actually g4, which is, would, would have been best here. And the reason for this becomes a little bit clear later on. But essentially, it is to isolate this e4 pawn. Okay. Which allows me to play in in the coming rook in game. So after something like queen takes b5, rook takes b5, f takes g4, f takes g4, rook c4, and rook b6. Like I really shouldn't be losing this. It should be quite a comfortable draw. The king cut off and the rook coming to c6 most likely to attack. If 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 g6, you could potentially play g5. Yeah, I think g5 I would probably be. Yeah. Okay. yeah, g5 looks strong there. So that instead, I played queen takes c4. It's not like the best, but it's not exactly, it isn't uh, terrible either. So rook takes c4, and this is a pretty critical position. And this, this is where I go horribly wrong, and I completely lose the thread of the game and, and lose the game. And also, like, where, I, where I think the other issue it comes in, which is time trouble. Okay. The last 10 moves, I was basically playing an increment, which is not ideal considering this is only move 34. So the last since move 25, I was playing an increment. Um, and yeah, so I make a horrible decision here. And that was uh, basically, I, I too try uh, sort of general overarching ideas here, which is how to deal with the c5 pawn. Either I use the rook and get the rook behind the pawn uh, with something like rook b6 or rook b8 or something like that. Or and what, what I chose in the game and for the wrong idea was to try and bring the king in front, try and win the c5 pawn and then hold on, hold on the king's side while I try and win the c5 pawn. So I think I'll quickly show the line which I played in the game and why I lost very quickly. Yeah. Um, and I'll show what what could have been very interesting um, if I played rook b8. So king e1, um, king g6. As it turns out, I just I was, I was far too slow here. Okay. Um, also, so, just a little... Sorry, Daniel, just hang on. Did you play king e1? Because I'm not seeing king e1 here. Yeah, I played king e1. It's not uh, not coming up there. No, it's not, it's not popping up. Hmm. Yeah, I hope the main line still this still sticks though, but um just make the arrow okay, is this a long long variation? Should I attempt to move it from my side? Um is it popping up now or still not? No, it's still one? still not. Still not. Um, um did you see rook b eight on the board? I play rook b eight. No, I haven't seen rook b eight actually. My board is actually not getting there. Let me just check here what's happening. Okay, I played rook b eight myself now. Okay. Um, king G6. Yeah, it pops up again. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, so let me try King E1 again if that pops up. King E1. Ah, there we go. There we see it. Yeah. Okay. okay. King E1. So King E1, King G6, uh, King D2, Rook B4. I sort of overlooked this too. Okay. Um, okay. I assume sort of Rook A4 automatically, but now I basically lose a tempo after Rook C1, Rook B2 checks being thrown in now as well. King is forced back. King D1, Rook B5, King C2. And essentially, my counterplay against the c5 pawn is just far, far too slow here. Uh, so rook e6, king c3, rook f6, king c4, rook f5 is covering the c5 pawn, h4. Desperately, desperately, desperately trying to keep black's king yeah. out here. Yeah. f6, uh, rook d1. And I think I was, I was trying to play probably um, rook d5. Um, but as I said, too slow. Uh, rook f2, king takes c5. Rook g2, rook d4, rook g3, rook takes e4. And this is, um, I mean, my king's too far away and there's just no saving this. So king d2, rook g2, king e4, rook g4, king f3, rook takes f4, trick, king takes f4, and king f7, and the pawn game is, uh, of course, lost. But um, the reason I want to show this game is because it's, I think uh, 
this rare or this in game actually much more interesting than than what happened in the game. Um, okay. Obviously, what happened if I had I defended properly, and that is with rook b8. Oh. And the reason that rook b8 is better than rook b6, for example, is that you get access to the to the e8 square as well, so that you can attack this e4 pawn, which is basically what my defense sort of hinges on here. After um, rook b6, um, I think rook c1 and I'm not sure if I'm holding here. Maybe I am, but it's not nearly as easy. It's more difficult, uh, yeah. Yeah. But my main fear, actually, um, going back to this position, was if I move the rook away, I was basically concerned about black playing rook c1, cutting my king off here permanently by covering the first rank, and then just running this c pawn down the board and eventually bring the king around as well, uh -huh. without any pressure on my side. That's basically what I was worried about. Yeah. But... Um, my defense basically hinges on the idea of rook b8 and then attacking both, not just the c pawn, but also the e pawn. Because defending the e4 pawn is actually not as easy as it might seem at first. Okay. Um, and yeah, the, the reason is that other move which I was mentioned earlier, which was g4, something I didn't really, I, think, I can't remember exactly what I was thinking at the time, but I probably underestimated this. So there are a few lines here. I'm sure remember which ones are worth looking at first. Um, I'm just thinking, think, of, thinking of some options where black can can black not maybe get in f5 just to reinforce yeah. f4 at some point. I have three lines here which we can look at. I think yeah. one of them is king b6, the other one is f6, and the other one is f5. So let's get okay. f5 first. Okay. So f5, uh, rook f8 is hitting the f5 pawn, king g6, and now uh, g4 ah. uh, undermines this. And my rook's active enough to just uh, even if I'm even if I'm down material, it just cleans up here. So h x g four, uh, h x g four, f takes g four, king g three, rook c two, king takes g four, rook takes e two. Yeah. Oh, right. Um, I think king f four probably no king f four. No king f four rook f two. Okay, that's just a blunder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but this is this is comfortably drawing rook takes e three, rook takes e five, um, because uh, black rook could be tied down to the defense of the e four pawn and. Black won't be able to make progress with his own pawn here. So it's king f4 coming next. And this is a, quite a simple draw, I think. Um, but yeah, so f5 wasn't much of a concern uh, because of g4. Yes. But uh, black has two like, pretty tricky options here. And those are uh, f6 and king g6. So I think let's look at maybe king g6 uh, first. I think f6 is probably the trickiest of them. Okay. So um, f, uh, king g6, g4. I said the idea being Main to idea. Uh, yeah cover the the f5 square yes um and now if hxg4 this is nothing to really worry about hxg4 hxg4 rook c1 rook e8 and well I, i'm totally fine here e4 is weak if f5 is played then both g7 and e4 and c5 will all be targets my rook and i'll hold that very easily um so better is to um just play rook c1 and here I'll analyze two lines now. Um, G takes h5 check and um, rook e8. So I think maybe let's look at G takes h5 check first. I think this, is, this one's a little bit worse than rook e8 immediately. We can just, it's also quite interesting. Yeah. So um, G takes h5 check, king takes h5, rook e8, f5, rook h8 check, king g5, h4 check, king g6, h5 check, king g5. Rook g8 hitting the g7 pawn, king f6, rook f8 check, king e5, rook g8, um, rook h1, rook takes g7, rook takes h5, king e1. Finally, the king comes yeah. around. Exactly, yeah. And this, this is actually quite an interesting in game I spent like, a little bit of time with today, trying to figure out if this is actually winning or not. But I, I'm pretty sure this is this is a winning for black. Um, essentially, I think the plan here is to, uh, so to, I'm make a few more moves here. Um, at the right time, uh, bring the king across and shepherd this c pawn down the board. Looks like uh, the rook a6. I think I think that uh, this should be winning for, for black. Okay. So g a5 check isn't the best, uh, I think. So going back to this position, I think rook uh, e8 is best. Um, and of course, uh, now f5 is forced. If rook c4 is played, then um, no progress is being made from the black side at all. Yeah. So f5, g takes h5 check, king takes h5, rook h8 check, king g5, h4 check, um, king f6, h5, king e5, and now um, just giving checks is better than playing um, at h6 like in the previous line. Rook e8 check, king d5, 
Um, rook f8, king e5. I think Black's basically tied down to the defense of this f5 pawn and can't really make progress here without losing it. Okay. So I think this, this line probably holds for white. Interesting stuff. Yeah. So yeah, white is holding on uh, really uh, tightly uh, with, with active play essentially. Yeah. Uh, and and so just targeting the e4 pawn. Of this game, like defending actively with the rook. Yes. I was, I was going far too passive with, with my rook um, and basically cost me. There's one other tricky line which I want to quickly show. Yeah. Probably most I think it's F6, you said. F6, yeah. So it doesn't seem um, like it has a, like, I mean, I didn't really see the idea behind yeah. this at first. Ooh. Especially when you consider that the E4 pawn is, is not being protected by this at all. Um, but the idea becomes uh, probably clear just now. So okay. um, after G4, again, trying to sort of cut off the support to this E4 pawn, H4, um, now. Um, let's just see what happens after the most natural move, which is rookie eight, I think, or yeah, any other move. Yeah. Now, black goes g5. Essentially, um, moving the sort of weakness which he had from um, what it would have been h4, it would have been g7, it would have been targets, moving the weaknesses to f6 and e4, which make it much easier for, for the black king to defend when he, when he slowly starts coming across. For the time being, the black rook could be left on c4 to defend both these pawns. Um, and I also, my king is completely stuck here. I can't make any sort of inroads to the, to the queen side. So just king g2, king g7, rook c8, bless king sort of just shuffles across to the queen side and he will uh, win this. King f2, king e6, rook c6, check, king e7, rook c7, check, king d6. And um, I think this will be winning for blacks very, very soon. Once the C-pawn starts rolling down the board. So the defense here is, um, at least um, <laughs> wouldn't occur to me. I think it's very obvious. Um, it was, it was rook f8, preventing g5. Yes. Uh, and preventing the whole idea of um, yeah, and the, the black king can't actually swing across. Um, yeah. And can't. When, whenever the rook tries to go active, then you knock on e4's door. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And also the other problem is if King G6 happens, um, uh, you see, yeah, if King G6 happens, then immediately it's just Rook H8 and other weaknesses at H4. Okay. And yeah, obviously a simple draw since the H4 point's dropping. So um, two options here, I'm look at quickly. Um, rook A4 and Rook C1. So if Rook C1, um, you just go back to Rook E8 and um, Rook C4 is forced and yeah. Rook F8, nothing, nothing changes. So I guess the critical move then is rook a4. And now um, well, white can hold this, uh, but obviously it's it's uh, got to be a little bit precise. So rook c8, rook a5, rook e8 attacking the e4 pawn again, king g6, uh, giving up the pawn. So still, um, the engine funnily enough gives this like plus plus one for black, um, but it doesn't, it seems like a much easier position to hold than some other ones we were looking at already. So now king f7, G5 is probably the simplest way to draw. Um, F takes G5, rook E5, king F6, and rook D5. And I even though, uh, yeah, yeah, everything's tied down after black. Nice, nice. G5, One sec. G5, and yeah, I think this is quite a simple draw now. Um, so Daniel, is it active rooks that, uh, I mean, your rook activity, that is the main feature that, uh, that you should have played? Yeah, definitely, yeah. That is essentially the reason I lost this game. Look at rook activity. Um, so I was trying to activate the king, but it wasn't the king which needed to be active. It was the, it was the rook. Uh, okay, yeah. and and then uh, the other thing as well, like you mentioned earlier before, maybe um, just that uh, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, just a pressure of of keeping the tension. Your opponent kept the tension just for as long, just enough for you to actually just. Uh, kind of make a small concession with knight e3 whereas if you had exactly. a bit more belief or a bit more uh, um, confidence in your position you could have carried on with knight a3 perhaps and so on and so on. Yeah. Well, a couple of things that we can learn from this but very cool um instructive uh, variations here in this game i think we can learn from yeah. learn how to defend and interesting ways of pushing from backside i think another like, interesting thing to mention is that um the reason this in game so difficult to defend is actually because of that 93 move I made, yeah. double the double the double e pawns basically uh, are death sentence for me here. 
Um, if the pawns were on like f2 and e2, then it would have been a fairly simple draw as well, just because of the, yeah, just the rook becomes active and it's a theoretical draw. But uh, with the double e pawns, they sort of, sort of block my king from coming in. Yeah. And they're also weak. So it's a bit of a double whammy there. Um, and yeah, I think you pretty much like hit the nail on the head there. Um, just keeping the pressure on, not really letting up was the reason I lost this game, or the reason uh, my opponent won this game. Um, and I think it's also like a, probably one of the most common ways which how uh, stronger players beat weaker players, yes. essentially. The game can be equal the whole way, but as long as you keep playing, eventually a mistake um, comes. And in this case, the, the big mistake was King E1. And yeah, and he won the game like that. So the second game, this game would be even more of a like illustration of that concept, basically just playing and even like the most simple positions often aren't as clear as they, as they might seem. Interesting. Uh, so Daniel, are you going to try to get that uh, position or next uh, yeah. game up for us? I'm not sure if it's going to just flip it's, over it's, to that side. Um, I do have one question in the chat box just uh, for yeah. you as well. Ah, there I see. Okay, the, the board changed. Okay, so question from Bearded Zaid. Um, welcome, Bearded Zaid. Uh, he said that most youngsters tend to move away from the game once school ends and studying um, at university begins. Have you ever felt a shift of focus away from chess, and how do you handle that balance? Um, I, I'd actually agree with that hundred percent. Like a lot of people do, unfortunately, start quitting chess once university begins. Um, I haven't really, um, largely due to um, basically how deeply involved I am in chess. But um, I definitely felt the urge to sometimes like put it on hold, especially now with this pandemic um, and the lack of tournaments. It's very, very uh, difficult to keep, keep to keep yourself motivated during these uh, basically like a year without any tournaments to play. Um, but yeah, I, I don't see myself ever really quitting. Probably, um, I mean, I'm gonna be playing for a long time still. Yeah. Well, you. Of course, we, we still need to see Daniel at the Olympiad. Calvin, I also have a question here. Uh, one of the viewers uh, uh, sent me a question here on, on the WhatsApp group, and he's asking if Daniel can remember the time that he played Blitz uh, like Fisher did uh, against Stahl in his hospital bed after taking a, 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 after a visit to the dentist. <laughs> sure, one, one of my favorite stories to actually tell. <laughs> tell us the story. <laughs> um so before i had braces I'd, i had to have my teeth pulled out to make space for yeah whatever um and after i had them pulled out for, by, by dr shabir um <laughs> immediately afterwards um I, with, with with like with cotton wool still in my mouth um still bleeding profusely um i get pulled aside into like the study and i get asked to play blitz with with dr shubs and um <laughs> I think we, I can't remember exactly how many games we played, but there's probably at least five. And then I think um, a secretary or something comes in and says, uh, uh, "Dr. Shabir, you you have a you have a, you have a patient waiting." He says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." It's less late, and we keep on playing. <laughs> Well, Daniel, we won't ask uh, how many games you, you won or lost there, but I mean, you were playing like a patient on that side, but well done there on, on that side, and hopefully we'll have Dr. Shubbs on the show one day soon as, as well with these stories. Daniel, yeah. tell us about the last game that uh, that you're going to show us tonight. Yeah, so I was I was black here. Um, actually, I, re I reset the... Uh, I yeah. thought I was going to flip the board, but I reset the thing to a new game. Give me one oh. sec. Um, okay, that yeah, flip it. okay, so this was actually a good tournament. The previous previous game I showed was some one of my worst tournaments ever. This one is one of, one of my best tournaments ever. Um, at the time of this round, I was on four out of four, um, including a win against I am and a GM. Um, so I was like I was doing great. I was playing black here against I think uh, an I am also on four out of four. Um, uh, David Gor uh, Gorodetsky. I think around 24.50 or so. So, um, yeah, let's have a look at the game. Okay. This is also the tournament in Romania, which I, I happened to miss out on the norm by, by two performance rating points. Ah, okay. So, yeah. Um, so d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop e4, we see the nimzo here. Um, and okay. I sort of moved so, away from... Daniel, you yeah. got the black pieces, right? Black pieces, yes. Now, let me just flip this board here. I've got it. I put it said, but we flip. 
Um, it's, it's up. Uh, there's like a gear on the top right of the board. It took me a while to find it as well. Ah, okay. Settings. Yeah. I find. Um, at, at the board, top right. Okay, let me actually just uh, maximize. So when I, when I've got this folder, this. Ah, okay. There, I see it. Pops up. Uh, okay. Here we go. We've got the yep. board here, right. So so bishop yep. goes back to e7. Of course, you don't want to take on c3 and then allow that knight to do what it was meant to do on e2. Yeah. All, all of this, all of course, theory. Yeah. So it's all uh, basically preparation or theory up until about move 12. Um, so it's e takes d5, knight f4, c6, bishop d3, knight a6, with the idea of bringing the knight back to c7 and e6. So actually, it's not the most common move. But I think it's, I really like this. I think this is a very simple and strong way to play. So castles, knight c7, b4, knight e6, knight c6, bishop takes e6. And here, like, I was, I was very accurate with everything. It basically went completely according to plan. Uh, I felt like I was already equal here. I think, I think I'm doing pretty well. Um, so what is h3? Um, here, I didn't play the best move. I could have just played, like, bishop d6 or something. Instead, I was going for um, knight e8. Which is like a pretty common idea. Of course, you often want the knight on d6 to cover basically the queen side and the king side. Yeah. But here it's a little bit too slow because b5 is coming. So whereas I might have been a little bit like basically equal, maybe even a little bit better in this position. Um after 98 b5, um, I'm a little bit worse again. So b5, c takes b5, knight takes b5, a6, knight c3, rook c8, bishop d2, b5. So all this is Roughly like okay. Um, again, I was a little, a little bit worse here. Nothing, uh, but nothing too uh, bad. So queen f3, g6, rook f d1, and f5. I'm not exactly sure why I played this. This isn't like the most aesthetic move, but um, I think I realized that this bishop on e6 is already pretty much buried. So I might as well just bury it completely by playing f5, <laughs> get the the e4 square for myself, yeah. and you get some counterplay going later on with um with f5 and g5 and maybe g4 so that is a pretty common theme in the queen's game declined yeah so f5 knight e2 obviously exploiting my inaccuracy immediately by targeting f4 um at f6 should be four changing my good bishop i mean i'm, I'm effectively was positionally i played here um knight e4 bishop takes e7 queen takes e7 a4 um bishop d7 like even even though i was basically positioning i played um i somehow managed to sort of wriggle out of this and get a decent position as we will see so bishop d7 a takes b5 bishop takes b5 um knight f4 hitting the d5 pawn um g5 now i'm trying to recall why knight knight d5. Takes d5. maybe after knight uh, d5 maybe just uh queen d6 or something yeah Is i'm pretty sure this that... Where's the knight going? Yeah, maybe the knight gets trapped maybe on, on d5. Um, but bishop e4, am I missing something? Yeah, I'm also, uh, I'm also wondering why I'm exactly I'm forgetting here because obviously I played this game a while ago. So, so I mean, queen d6, uh, just queen d6 takes, takes, queen takes, and my. Yeah. Could, could do that. Yeah. Seems about the risky for him to take rook e8, perhaps. So I think. Uh, unless I'm missing something, yeah, I think I win peace. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like that's the. the that's probably okay. the reason. Yeah. Interesting. So G5. So e4. Yeah. Your opponent also yeah. believes you on that one, so it's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. E6 E4. Um, F6 E4 looks pretty tempting, but uh, to Queen G3, uh, I'm just getting. Uh, I'm struggling here. D5 yeah. is weak. G, uh, D5 is weak. Everything is falling. So D takes E4. Queen G3. King h8, knight e5, queen e6, knight c7, queen f6, knight takes b5, a takes b5. So I basically managed to sort of emerge here with a decent position. I'm not doing too badly anymore. Um, uh, f4 is potentially coming if he allows it. If yeah. he doesn't, he plays uh, queen e5, going going into rick and game. I'm quite happy to oblige. Queen takes e5, d takes e5. Um, and this is a sort of position which... which <laughs> I think most people, including me, would assume it's like an almost automatic draw. But as we will see, it's not uh, that clear at all. 
So um, I played Rook FD8. I think this, this is all like best player uh, up until uh, the next couple moves at least. Um, I'm trying to remember why exactly I couldn't play Rook FE8. Maybe like D5 or something. Oh, yeah, it could be Rook D5, but I think also maybe Rook D7 followed by Rook A7. Yes, is, is, that's also is very scary. issue your open king now. Yeah. So Rook FD8 is played to try and trade off a pair of Rooks. Rook D6, Rook takes D6, E takes D6, King G7, Rook B1. Uh, King F6, which takes B5, Rook D8. So it seems like I'm uh, pretty much equalized here. Like I'm going to win back the D6 pawn, and it looks like it's virtually like a dead draw. But it really it isn't the case, unfortunately, um, because of why it's next move. That is uh, G4. Aha, something similar that we saw earlier about undermining the E4 pawn. Yeah, mm. exactly. So, um, and this actually, like, even though it doesn't look like much, it, my, my position becomes an absolute nightmare now. Because I'm effectively losing a pawn one way or another, I think. So after F takes G4, Rook H takes G4, Rook takes D6, Rook F5 check, I'm forced to go to G6, unless uh, I want to lose the G5 pawn. But now after King G6, Rook E5, I'm going, I'm losing the E4 pawn. Yeah. So even though it seemed like a fairly standard uh, drawn position here, it wasn't the case. Um, but still, this this position is in fact drawn, even though I'm down a pawn. But I just need to defend quite accurately, which I didn't. Um, just a question, Daniel. Still, just a question. Yeah. Um, in this position, okay, uh, maybe I'm just missing something straightforward here. But after this, is eight six possible? You just six. check. I don't think I looked at that. Um, I'm trying to remember now why um, I didn't play it. Um, maybe you can go. Um, maybe White can go here. And I'll... I think Rook B five. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, this is it. Yeah. And so yeah, you don't have enough okay. time to actually get the pawn. So I guess that's yeah. like, that explains why you actually other line. Okay. But you, yeah. Instead of h6, you went rook takes pawn, right? Yeah, rook takes pawn. Okay. okay. This is actually all pretty okay. I hadn't made a mistake in a while, I think. This is all pretty accurate. But the mistake comes just now, as you will see. Uh, so king d6, rook e5, h5, g takes h5, check, king takes h5, king g2. King g4. Um, so that's probably the first mistake. Um, I could have played rook f6, rook takes e4, and now uh, g4, which makes it very difficult for white for black to make, or sorry, for white to make progress. Um, if king f1 and g3, and otherwise um, probably going to blockade with rook rook f3, and then it's quite difficult for white to, as I said, make progress here. But instead, I played um, king g4, takes e4, check king f5, rook a4, rook b6, king f3, rook b5. This is all still like fine. There's no, no real area. Yet. I'm just sort of holding on, waiting. Um, rook b2, uh, rook a6, king e5, rook a5, check, king f6, rook a6, check, king e5. You're just sort of gaining time there with increment, I think. Yeah. Uh, rook a8, rook b4, rook a8. So, so, so far, it's just been a sort of shuffling pieces around. It hasn't really made any progress. But that's obviously like part of the plan here. There's no need to reform for white to rush. Yeah. Such a position. It's, um, I mean, he's got the extra pawn, he's got 50 moves to, to use it. Um, so he just sort of ties me out. Yeah. Um, and so far, it's like, I've basically just been shuffling my rook up and down as well. Like, I haven't been doing too much. I've been playing rook, rook b4, rook b2, rook b5, and so on. Nothing really seems to be uh, too scary here. But the position after rook f8 is a little bit different. Because now, why does it go, actually a pretty solid, scary plan, which is to sort of get these pawns rolling by playing... Um, King G3 and F3 start pushing the pawns. Um, and I, I I go wrong here. So I play almost like on instinct, like rook A4, so it's just waiting again. But this is actually the, the, the time I have to be like quite a size that I like play rook B1. Rook B1, so yeah. only just to kick him if he goes to the G file. Exactly, yeah. That's I was, easy, I wasn't that's an really easy mistake to make, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't really awake to this. I didn't see this simple plan of King G3, F3, and rolling the pawns forward coming. And of course, if, if King G4, then Rook G1 check, King H3, King E4, Rook G8. And um, yeah, I'm holding on here. King G3, I also go check. Oh, sorry, I go Rook E1. But I th yeah, I think Rook G1 check is also fun. But it's not fun. good, yeah. Yeah, Rook G1 check, King F3, and uh, yeah, I'm fine there. The Rook E1 is basically like my little... Uh, uh, momentary like lapse in in uh, basically um in, yeah awareness really.
uh, sort of just playing on instinct, not really thinking uh, too carefully. Um, so rook a4 allows white's plan, and other position goes quickly from from being equal and being drawn uh, to to being lost. So king g3, um, king e6, f3. Now the pawns are rolling, and it's very very difficult to stop them, unfortunately. So um, uh, rook a1, e4. Now with these pawns um, sort of protecting each other and and your king uh, cut off from uh, your own pawn as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and that pawn being weak, there's no real saving this anymore. So rook a5, king g4, rook b5, king h5, rook a5, king g6. Um, I mean, there's something for, really for me to do here, unfortunately. f3 pawn is covered. F5 I just need is to covered. And rook f5 is coming, as you say. So I played g4 like a last desperate attempt, but it's nothing, nothing really. Um, I think it's going to happen. f takes g4, rook a4, g5, king e5, rook e8, check, king f4. I think I resigned here because um, there's not much to do. Yeah. Both rolling down. There's no way to stop them, unfortunately. So I guess the, the takeaway here is like the position which seems so so symmetrical and so drawn um, was not actually um, drawn at all. G4 well, it wasn't at least not completely drawn. This last plane, it, even in such like a dry position, G4 was able to create a weakness in E4, That's win a pawn, win the game. Yeah. Uh, just a question, Daniel. Uh, just, I've got two questions in the chat box here. Uh, the yeah. first one from Charles. Okay, I kind of know the answer to this one as you've been on the show quite a bit already. But Charles is, Charles Eichap is saying, uh, welcome Charles, by the way. Uh, he's saying, which world champion did Daniel study the most and why? It's probably like in order, like, of the old world champions, let's say Karpov, of like all of them, probably it goes in order like Carlson, Karpov, then um, Kaplanka, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. And... There you have it, Charles. And then from Mark, Mark is also asking about the game. Um, he's asking, giving up the B pawn was that necessary? Um, he calculated that he could st that you could still get the passed pawn in time. Um, in this position, I guess so. Um, in Mark is not being too specific, but it maybe uh, because you you about to give up your B pawn, so is it B eight possible? Yeah. D7, uh, and then rook takes B five, and the next move is coming. But uh, maybe King F F six. Um, but rook takes b5 anyway. Oh yeah, rook takes I b5 think. anyway, yeah. And you yeah. get a similar situation, rook d8 and g4 and basically... Yeah. Yeah, there you have it. Um, so, not possible indeed. But if there's uh, another position, um, I don't think there's another position I could have done it. I mean, otherwise the rook's coming to the seventh yeah. rank here. I agree. So, so, your opponent had quite an interesting idea there, queen e5 and transposing into a, a rook end game, double rook end game. In yeah, I, I think... <laughs> I think he's honestly just as surprised as I was that he won oh. the game at the end. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think he was expecting to win after Queen E5, really. Um, uh -huh. I'm not sure if he saw this whole line. I, I sort of doubted. But it's clearly he still had a little bit of pressure, and he obviously kept on playing and saw that pressure. Mm. Yes. And eventually I cracked and lost the game. I think, again, like, like we were speaking about, uh, like we were mentioning the previous game, um, against weaker players, uh, the strong player often just keeps on playing and playing and playing, even until like basic kings are on the board. And uh, eventually, often a mistake does come, like in this. Mm. Interesting stuff, Daniel. I think it was really cool uh, you showing these two games, even though you lost them. I mean, I think that's the main thing that us, us chess players must do is learn from the losses. You shared a bit of knowledge there from, from your experience. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, very interesting stuff over there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Calvin, in, uh, I think from my side, uh, Daniel, thank you very much for showing us uh, these games. I also played through the games uh, when you sent it to me uh, as well. And I thought I was looking wrongly. And then I saw that both games you lost. So so yeah. quite clearly you uh, you wanted us to learn something also from it. So thank you very much for, for sharing that. And uh, Daniel, I'm sure uh, season three, season four, once you've started to play, uh, Reflections will be calling you back uh, <laughs> to, to yeah, are you are you progressing with those IM uh, and GM norms uh, to come. So Daniel, from my side and uh, from the viewers, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to be on uh, tonight. Thanks, Calvin. Thanks, Lyndon. <laughs> Lots of fun as always. Thanks. Okay, Great. guys. So let's switch over back to uh, to to the library just to to uh, finish off with everything. So yeah, again, once uh, once again from my side, uh, Daniel, just thanks a lot for for joining us again. It's always good to have the SA champion in the house. So. Um, 
yeah, great stuff. And uh, yeah, always a pleasure to have you, Daniel. Thanks for taking out your time to us this evening. Yeah. And um, yeah, th if to everybody in the chat box, uh, I, I got a message here from, from one of the viewers saying that he couldn't uh, get going in the chat box. So just make sure if you were struggling to type in the chat box, that there's a sign up button at the top of the page usually. Um, just press on sign up and you just fill in a couple of questions there. Basically, you just create your own profile and then come back to, to this page, the Calvin Class and Chess page, and press the follow button and that will enable the chat, chat box. So so that's that. And sometimes, guys, it's it's more friendly to use your laptop or computer. Sometimes you can struggle if you use your, your phone and so on. So, so yeah. Uh, is one in the chat box saying th many thanks, Daniel. And Earl also saying thanks, thank you so much, Daniel. So thanks to, to everybody for watching as well. And um, yes, we had um, um, I am what I say last week, but we couldn't really get all the questions in. Um, and uh, yeah, guys, we we should try to to just throw in your questions as soon as you can. But uh, London, can you tell us what's happening next week then? Yes, uh, thanks, Calvin and 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 Daniel. We. Um... We're actually going to invite uh, I am Wataku Bese back for next week because we never finished our interview. Because, you know, Wata's uh, career is uh, over 30 years and uh, we only got till 1995. So uh, <laughs> so we have to still go from 95. We have got to hear some of those interesting war stories that Wata has. And, uh, and then we'll probably see how far we can get uh, with that. So, Calvin, so uh, Daniel and the viewers, let's uh, see what we can. And and remember last week, uh, Wata entertained us with a, a game against Judith Polga that, that he won. And he was telling us about Karpov that uh, also congratulated him there in France. So, uh, so let's see what uh, Wata has in store. Um, in, in on next Tuesday. Yes, it's uh, it's bound to be exciting. Always good to have Watu on as well. But yes, this was a lovely evening with Daniel, of course, and we're looking forward to the next one, guys. So, so if you haven't pressed that follow button yet, do so. And uh, yeah, we will see you uh, next week, guys. Same time, same place. Enjoy your evening, guys. Thank you, Landon. Thanks, Thanks Daniel. Thanks, Calvin. Thanks, guys. Daniel. See you. Yes, cheers. Bye, viewers. Bye.